Welcome back again, one and all. Laszlo Montgomery here with another China History Podcast episode. Thanks for fitting me into your schedule for this brief moment in time. I hope everyone's year of the tiger is off to a roaring start. You know, I rarely ever feature anyone who's still living as a CHB topic. I think there's only been a few episodes that explored the lives of living people. Prior to his accession to the leadership of the CCP at the 18th Party Congress, I introduced the life of Xi Jinping. And although he later passed in 2014, I covered the life of Sir Run Run Shaw back in July of 2011. And one of the earliest episodes I ever published, back when I started the CHP, covered the life of Sir Li Ka Shing, Li Jia Cheng, still looking good at 93 years old. Today's subject has a couple things in common with Li Ka Shing. First, he's a rich and successful entrepreneur. And secondly, although Li Ka Shing was born in Chaozhou, the topic of today's CHP episode was born in Vietnam, but traced his roots back to the very same Chaozhou people. There's roughly 25 to 30 million people worldwide who are part of this Dioju linguistic group. In our day, we remember many marquee Dioju tycoons, such as Li Ka Xing, uh, Lim Por Yan, uh, Vincent Lo, Chin Sapanpanich, Danin Chiravanant, and Liao Jia Heng. Those tycoons are the ones most of us have heard of because of the scale of the commercial empires that they've built. But overwhelmingly, the lion's share of successful Diochu entrepreneurs and business persons were mostly small-time people. And in the communities where they lived, they were the ones who often owned businesses and made modest but eh, respectable fortunes. Many of these Diochus were pillars of their community and shared their success with those they lived amongst as philanthropists, builders of schools and temples, sponsors of local sports teams, and donors to other public structures. They might not have counted themselves among the mega-rich, like those I just named, but in the small cities and towns where they resided, many of them were the richest ones. And that's how the Diochu people earn that reputation as renowned business persons and generous philanthropists. Today, I wanted to discuss someone who isn't as well known as the company he founded nor the product he manufactures, a product that many of you CHP listeners might already use. He perfectly fits the mold of the hardworking, dedicated entrepreneur who, even in the face of hardship and difficult challenges, followed in the footsteps of so many of his fellow Diochus to build a company from nothing, and through the force of his own will and by sticking to his principles, turned his idea into a magnificent success. This is the story of a man known in his homeland of Vietnam as Chen Ho. His Chinese name is Chen De. Where I come from, we know him as David Tran. His ancestors were among those 4th and 5th century migrants from China's central plain who fled south rather than face death at the hands of the Wuhu, the five northern barbarian tribes of Xiongnu, Xianbei, Di, Qiang, and Jie. And David Zhen's ancestors were part of this exodus fleeing from them and were part of that group who ultimately ended up in this Chaoshan region of China. So blessed with an abundance of everything humans needed to survive and thrive, chief among them a heaven's bounty of seafood. And because this Chaoshan region of China was right on the southern coast, these people were among those Chinese who made up the largest part of the diaspora who migrated to all ports of Southeast Asia and beyond, out into the world, and created new lives for themselves and their families bringing that hard-working, Diochu entrepreneurial spirit with them, and that passion to succeed and to achieve it whatever they did, no matter in business or science, medicine, or engineering, or whatever. If you remember from that six-part series on the history of China-Vietnam relations, during the fourth of four periods of Chinese domination in Vietnam— This one during the Ming Dynasty from 1407 to 1427, starting with Emperor Yong Le. A lot of Chinese migrated down to Vietnam. 
During the 1700s and 1800s, too, more Chinese found Vietnam a perfect destination, far from the rebellions and unrest in their homeland. And then during the agonizing final decades of the Qing Dynasty, again, many Chinese chose to leave their homes, and to Vietnam, many of them went. And these people in Vietnam were called the Hoa, from the Chinese word Hoa. In the 1920s and 30s, even more Chinese migrated down to Vietnam. They were escaping the warlords and later from the Japanese. And of course, the French colonialists there were only too happy to have them, bringing all their high-octane entrepreneurial savvy that added to the economy of Indochine. During the 19th century, David Jun's grandparents were one of those who had the same idea, and they sailed from their Chaoshan homeland to Vietnam, joining the ever-growing population of Vietnamese Hua people. Once they arrived, they did what came natural to them after so many centuries, and in all kinds of ways, big and small, these Dioju Chinese did well for themselves in Vietnam. The majority of Chinese in Vietnam were Cantonese, and no matter which linguistic group you came from in the Jolan district of Saigon, Cantonese was the lingua franca, and David John grew up speaking it. He was born and raised not far from Saigon, born in the year of the rooster, 1945. When the French were defeated at Dien Bien Phu in May of 1954, David John was nine years old. When Saigon fell and was renamed Ho Chi Minh City, he was 30 years old. And it was right around that time he was working with his older brother, producing chili sauce from peppers grown on his brother's farm outside of the city, earning a few extra dome, selling it around town. He had picked up this skill of mixing chili sauce when he was serving as a major in the Vietnam Army. You know, I debated whether or not to get into this, but I figure since we're looking at the life and heritage of David Chun, let's take this short detour and mention a few things about how chili peppers, as we know and love them, actually came to China and to Vietnam. When I read Brian Dott's book, The Chili Pepper in China, there were a few very fascinating points that I had not known and was very surprised to discover. The chili pepper that most of us know Capsicum annuum, that is always front and center to so many great Asian cuisines and dishes. Prior to the 16th century, Ming Dynasty, it didn't even exist in China or Asia. Now, the Sichuan pepper, or Huajiao, the Ma La pepper, that's indigenous to Sichuan. And there's also black pepper, or Huajiao. But I'm talking about red and green chili peppers, La Jiao. Those are not indigenous to Asia. Just like how tea trees grew naturally in the world between Sichuan, Yunnan, and all the way west to the Brahmaputra Valley, for chili peppers, their original garden on this earth was in Central America and the northern parts of South America. And it was as a result of the voyages beginning with Christopher Columbus in the 1490s that Europeans discovered the chili pepper, and all these other New World foods. And it was the many intrepid explorers who brought these chili peppers from the Americas to their trading entrepots they had set up in today's India, Malaysia, Indonesia, and after 1557, in China as well. Thanks to the age of discovery, from the 1400s to the 1600s, all kinds of commodities, foods, spices, knowledge and ideas were passed around. It was like the Silk Roads during the Han and Tang dynasties. So many things were passed around back and forth between people of all lands, and so quickly, too. Two Chinese researchers wrote in 2005 in the journal Zhongguo Nongshi that chilies came to China in three locations. In the north, in Liaoning, where chilies were passed to the Chinese by the Koreans, who got them first. And then the next entry point was in Taiwan, where they got the chilies from the Dutch. And in the eastern ports of China, they got their first chilies from Southeast Asian people. And it was mainly the Portuguese, but also the Spanish, who, because of their colonies in the Americas, first encountered the chili pepper and brought them to all the lands they explored, including China, and in 1516, 
in Vietnam. And with that first visit by a Portuguese vessel, that's where the Vietnamese first got to see a chili pepper and taste it. And because it grows almost anywhere, if you plant the seeds and take care of the plant, anyone could grow chilies. So it never became the big commodity item like nutmeg or black pepper that required a certain kind of soil and tropical climate to thrive in nature. The most important and critical year as far as the arrival of chili peppers into Southeast Asia was 1511, when the Portuguese captured Malacca. It probably took one or two decades at least before the people of Malacca learned to embrace chili and started to grow it in their gardens and farms. And from Malacca, chilies were transported far and wide across the region, including to China, where traders brought it to the east coast of China, where it traveled inland from there, and overland from Burma, where the chili pepper entered China from the southwest, all in the 15 and 1600s. Now, a lot of Asian people can relate to this. In my wife's family, a few of them, Jingao, Jimai, An Wang, my father-in-law, of course, they grow chili peppers in their backyards from seeds given to them by friends or that they procured during trips back to Vietnam. And they make their own chili sauce and share it with each other. You know, even the old family friend that they used to know back in Vietnam, Bak Ho, who ran this small grocery here, I've had a jar or two of his chili sauce in my fridge too. And in my house right now, I got some of Ching Ao's chili sauce in my fridge inside door. And if my dear mother-in-law was her old self and not ailing like she is, she'd have always kept us fully stocked all year long. So David Chun and his brother, they did the same thing. They knew how to make chili sauce. And he went around his part of Vietnam and sold his product and slowly mastered the grinding and mixing process and developed a taste for what he believed most people wanted in their chili sauce that they'd use to dip their seafood in or dumplings into or to add to their fun noodle soup, the national dish of Vietnam, a name that non-Vietnamese speakers like myself have been butchering for years, fall. Well, starting in 1976, for people like David Chun, the time suddenly got very turbulent. After the Vietnam War, as we call it here in the U.S., the Hua people of Vietnam started to feel the heat as the government pointed at them and said to all the good people of Vietnam, those guys there, they ain't no good. And to those who might have been predisposed to feel that way in the first place, well, they weren't shy in demonstrating their scorn. Then, leading up to that border war, fought between Vietnam and China from February 17 to March 16, 1979, and especially afterwards, ethnic Chinese in Vietnam had to fall back into survival mode to get through these times. Ethnic unrest is no stranger to most places, but when the government puts their formidable thumb on the scale and plays favorites, one side and always faces a good chance of getting plowed under. And people like David Chun, who was just some small-time guy hustling all around his neighborhood, selling recycled Gerber baby food jars filled with his pepper saute chili sauce, well, in the current political climate, he might as well have been a blood-sucking landlord and a big-time abusive factory boss all rolled up into one. So these Chinese Vietnamese had to run a pretty long gauntlet of persecution. The government imposed this ban on any Hua Vietnamese, you know, ethnic Chinese. It didn't matter. Teochew, Cantonese, Hakka, Hokkien. The rule applied to all of them. And 12 businesses and trades that these people had pretty much dominated since the 19th century were mandated as off-limits for them. They had to find something else to do. And it finally got so bad for David John and others like him that they were left with little choice but to follow that time-worn tradition that many other persecuted people had been forced to endure before them, going back to the beginning of recorded history. Like the European Jews of the mid to late 1930s before him, David John slowly converted his family's wealth into gold. And at the end of 1978... 
33 years old, after he had saved up enough, he bought passage for himself and his family on a few of these refugee boats. I remember back in the 1970s and 80s, and some of you might also, reading about these tragedies always happening at sea when dozens or hundreds of Vietnamese refugees at a time would be rescued or would perish at sea when their boat would capsize and sink. For this reason, David Jun split the family up into four boats just in case the unthinkable happened. David Jun, Chun De, wound up fleeing his homeland along with 3,300 others in his similar circumstance, and they crowded shoulder to shoulder in a vessel called the Hui Fong. It was a Taiwan-owned, Panamanian-registered vessel, and they departed some port in Vietnam and headed off to destination unknown. Now, my wife's family left in 1975 because my father-in-law worked for the Americans at Tansan Yut Airport. And with credentials like that, he and his family, his wife and 11 kids, they were earmarked for a life of unpleasantness and hardship. So the USA flung open its arms to them and so many others in their similar situation. And this initial migration in 1975 brought this first big wave of Vietnamese to our shores. But David Jun, he was leaving for a different reason. He and others like him weren't tainted with any past association with the Americans. For them, it was a Chinese thing. After the war was over... He and his kind, the Chinese Vietnamese, the Hua people, they weren't made to feel very welcome in this land that most of them had been living in for countless generations. So for many of these people who sailed out into the South China Sea, and in David Jun's case, the first stop was usually Hong Kong. And once they arrived, they got all sorted out at any one of the refugee centers there before they'd be resettled elsewhere. There were also a great amount of other refugees who fled Vietnam for economic reasons and who weren't ethnic Chinese. The Vietnamese refugee crisis back then involved cases like David Chun and others as well who were just trying to escape poverty. When we lived in Hong Kong during the 1990s, my wife worked for Save the Children and often went to these facilities, you know, for interpreting and assisting in the handling and administration of the refugees. She used to go to Green Island, Hailing Chow, Pillar Point, Whitehead, Sek Gong, Tai A Chow, all these camps. Over 60,000 of these Vietnamese refugees passed through these places. But David Jun and his family, though they left on separate boats, were all reunited in the camps in Hong Kong, and they managed to get out reasonably fast and were able to make their way to Boston. Not long after... David Chun made a decision to follow the route of many an ethnic Chinese immigrant before him who chose the path of food to earn their pen quotidian. So he contacted his brother in L.A. and asked him if he knew whether or not they grew chili peppers out there. And upon learning that, indeed, lots of chili peppers were grown in that fertile California soil, David opted to throw caution to the winds, and off he went, the spring of 1980. You could say it was perfect timing because David Chun wasn't the only overseas Vietnamese starting a new life for themselves in California. Little Saigon, down in Orange County, was just becoming a thing around 1978-1979 and into the early 1980s. So that side of David Chun that, over the centuries, sort of became second nature to the Diochu people, It inspired him to start up a new venture, and he went right back into the chili sauce business. The raw materials were all readily available. Chili peppers, vinegar, garlic, salt, sugar. And when he asked himself, the first question any entrepreneur was obliged to ask themselves, can you make it better, faster, or cheaper? He felt confident he could make a better product than what the rapidly growing market already had. And he founded his own company, Huifeng Foods, named for the crowded vessel he boarded when he escaped from Vietnam. No bank was willing to back him at first, so he had to take everything he had and 
sink it into the business. At first, he branded it as Thai-style saute sauce. He bought a 50-gallon electronic mixer and blue minivan, and the Jun family members all got in on the business venture. And David Jun, he pushed his product in downtown L.A. at Grand Central Market and went door-to-door to all the Asian grocers and restaurants in L.A. and Orange County. The establishments up and down Bolsa Avenue and Westminster, where Little Saigon was centered, were instant customers. And right from the get-go, he began pulling in a profit, modest though it was at first. He rented a 6,500-square-foot place on Spring Street in L.A. Chinatown and began to scale up the business. And David John had all these old-fashioned business principles that he lived by. Chief among these, of course, was a certain work ethic and the quality and consistency of his product and pouring his heart and soul into his business, not for the money. That all followed naturally because he was never looking to build a chili sauce empire. Vietnamese immigrants were pouring into places like Southern California and up in San Jose throughout the 80s and into the 90s. So he had quite a burgeoning market to sell to. And his chili sauce, even though he was selling it to a lot of people who made their own, there was something about David John's product that Asian people seemed to enthusiastically embrace. He called his brand Sriracha. That's a Thai name. And back in the early 80s, when David John was starting out, the number of Thai restaurants in California was really starting to take off. Even though he spelled it S-R-I-R-A-C-H-A, the more accurate pronunciation comes from the town it was named after on the coast of southern Thailand in between Bangkok and Pattaya. It's more correct to call it Sriracha. But the locals who live there, they don't say the R, and it comes out sounding more like Siacha. Yeah, it was a local woman from that town, named Tanoma Chakapak, who first came up with this Siracha sauce, and named it after this place she came from. Hers is the original Siracha sauce. Today, it's known as Siracha Panich, still made in Thailand. It's one of the hottest-selling brands in the whole country. And David John's product, the one that's maybe in your fridge or cabinet that you see in so many Asian restaurants, and for sure in any Vietnamese restaurant or home, is the one in the clear cylindrical plastic bottle with white printing and a twisting green cap. That one. Sriracha chili sauce made by Hoi Phong Foods. That's the chili sauce that David John invented and perfected. And I'll tell you, he sure fooled me. Back in 1983, when I could often be found at my future wife's family compound in Hawthorne, just north of LAX, that bottle, with its overall design, Chinese, Thai, and Vietnamese writing on the outside label, to me it looked like it was imported from Vietnam or somewhere in Asia. But one day I noticed, and this must have been after 1987, that this chili sauce that my wife's family always used, and that my mother-in-law would squirt on the noodles she made for me, and on all kinds of other traditional Vietnamese delicacies, was made in Rosemead, a 20-minute drive east of downtown L.A. You see, David John's Chinatown operation became too small, and to meet the growing demand for his product, Hui Fong Foods moved their production facility to this 68,000 square foot building and warehouse that used to be where the great toy company Whammo kept their inventory of hula hoops, slip and slides, and frisbees. And the wholesale price for Hui Fong Sriracha sauce back then was, and remains to this day, so low that restaurants would just keep the whole 28 ounce bottle on the table. And if customers used it up too quickly, who cared? There was plenty more where that came from. For more than 35 years, the wholesale price hasn't gone up. Then in 2010, as the renown of his sriracha sauce became so great and sales began to exceed 20 million bottles a year, and the renown of its flavor and versatility moved beyond the core Asian customers who couldn't live without it, David John moved his Hui Feng Shipping Gong Si to an even bigger facility on a 23-acre site that's just a few minutes away by car from the Miller Brewing Plant that I pass all the time off the 210 freeway in Irwindale, California. In that year of 2010, 
Bon Appetit magazine had named David John's Sriracha Sauce Ingredient of the Year, which turned up the heat on his company's prospects. At first, David John used Serrano peppers that originated in the mountains of Puebla and Hidalgo states north and south of Mexico City. But due to harvesting issues in Southern California, he changed the pepper stock to a cultivar of the Serrano pepper that is beloved in the great state of California, and that's called the jalapeno. The jalapeno, whose history went back to the time of the Aztecs, is one of those kinds of peppers that won't scorch your mouth, but at 3,500 to 8,000 Scoville heat units, it has enough capsaicin content that It's still pretty hot. And from late summer to mid-autumn, the jalapenos were harvested from local suppliers and delivered straight to his factory by the truckload. Then they were cleaned, processed, and ground down into chili mash. And this chili mash was then poured into these 50-gallon blue barrels, and forklift drivers would store them six pallets high in the warehouse for eventual processing into any one of the three kinds of chili sauces that David Jung's Huifeng Foods manufactured. Though the annual pepper harvest is turned into chili mash only over a a two-and-a-half to three-month period, the product is bottled year-round, and as many as 200,000 or more of these 50-gallon barrels kept in inventory are slowly used up. One of the three sauces produced by Huifeng is an Indonesian-style chili sauce called sambal olek. This one is the least processed and is essentially just the chili paste. Then there's the garlic chili sauce, which I and millions of others around the world keep a bottle of in their homes at all times. And by far and away, the hottest seller Huifeng Foods produces, the Tabasco of Sriracha sauces, is David John's Dung Ot Sriracha Chili Sauce, the recipe of which hasn't changed hardly at all since 1983. You can get a 28-ounce bottle of the stuff at any supermarket in my zip code for $4.99 or $2.99 for the 17-ounce bottle. And though he's a multi-millionaire many times over who owns a company that he could sell tomorrow for more than a billion dollars or euros, David Jun remains a very low-key guy. Not a flashy Chu Feng To looking for any opportunity to exhibit a dose of false modesty. Some of the most famous companies in the food business keep knocking on his door looking to buy him out. He never trademarked the Sriracha name as a brand, so along with the success he's had, competing companies have flooded the market with all kinds of other Sriracha sauces, including the big daddy of them all, Lake Um Gay. Despite all the competition, the Huifeng Foods version of this almost-but-not-quite necessity of life for so many keeps growing a steady 20% per year, with annual sales today exceeding $150 million of a product that only retails for under 5 bucks. He still maintains a stranglehold on about 10% of the almost $2 billion U.S. market for this category of food condiment. As far as he sees it, all these copycats and fast food joints offer him free publicity for his brand of sriracha. His green twist-off cap that tells you right away it's the Huifeng Foods version of chili sauce, that's trademarked. The green cap symbolizes the green stem of a fresh jalapeno pepper. And the rooster on the bottle, that's the year I mentioned that David John was born. He's had a couple bumps in the road along the way to success. He had an acrimonious falling out with his exclusive jalapeno pepper supplier for 30 years. That cost him about $23 million to settle. And after he moved into his new location in Irwindale, when he was grinding those chilies, some of the local residents there started to feel the burn seeping into their homes and wafting around their property. In October 2013... Some of them organized and went to the city government to try and shut down his plant as a public nuisance. So overwhelming was the pungency of what was emanating from his 650,000 square foot plant during the chili grinding process. Up until that point, David John had always operated as far below the radar as he could. 
but when it came time to reconcile with the forces lined up against him, he put in the necessary ventilation equipment to capture most of the offending vapors. And in 2014, he opened up the factory to the public and gave tours of the place, and many of the local people who placed a great deal of their culinary faith in his product, he posed for pictures with them, and by popular demand, had to open up a gift shop. It was a triumph of public relations, and he even got Governor Jerry Brown to speak up in his defense. In the end, the city of Irwindale dropped the suit in May 2014. Over the period of the last decade especially, but even going back further, David John's Sriracha Chili Sauce has achieved quite a following, uniting people of all nations, races, and ethnicities. Filmmaker Griffin Hammond did a short documentary on David John called Sriracha. All three of Hoi Fong's chili sauces are now shipped all over the world, including Vietnam, of all places. And these 17 and 28 ounce Sriracha bottles with the iconic clear plastic squeeze bottle and the green twisting cap are found in more places than your local Vietnamese diner. High-end restaurants and burger joints also swear by this stuff. And to this day, David Chun still uses the same distributors that stuck with him since his humble beginnings. He has no sales team and doesn't even advertise. People just know of this stuff and have become hooked. The most diehard of fans have produced their own fan-made commercials advertising their love for what David Chun made. Go on YouTube. There's a whole bunch of them. And David John's story, like I said, eh, he was no Lee Ka Shing by a long shot. All David John humbly ever set out to do was to make a rich man's sauce at a poor man's price, using a mixture of jalapeno chilies, garlic, salt, vinegar, and sugar. But like the founder of Chong Gong, David John's ancestors came from the same place in China, on the southern coast of Guangdong, right where it hits Zhangzhou Prefecture, where so many of their Hokkien cousins come from, in Fujian province. And though these people who came from this Chaoshan region of China weren't the only ones who worked hard and achieved success, emigrating to places all over the world, they did it enough times and in such a way as to earn this reputation. I suppose you could say this as well when talking about the Hokkien, Hokkien, Hakas, and Cantonese. One can argue David Chun is hardly a consequential person from the annals of Chinese history. So, I wanted to thank you all for indulging me and listening to this story. I've said it over and over going back to 2010. Chinese history is more than the stories of what happened in China. The Chinese people who left their homeland and went out into the world, they were part of this history too, and the heritage. Now, I myself have never met David John, and as I said, they don't advertise, so no one offered to give me any backhanders to do this CHP episode. But during the recent holiday season, as I was squirting some sriracha sauce into my nook mom to dip my jaya in, I thought about David John as someone with a China story worth telling. You know, there's a video on YouTube of the ISS astronauts using David John's sriracha sauce right inside the confines of the space station orbiting our good Earth. With that squeeze bottle, it was perfect for use in outer space. So, that's all I got for you this time. Class dismissed. And once again, I'd like to extend my most heartfelt wishes to every single one of you in our little worldwide CHP community for a happy and healthy Year of the Tiger. This is Laszlo Montgomery signing off from Los Angeles, California. Not too terribly far from the Huifong Foods factory, in fact. And as always, I look forward to seeing you in the not-too-distant future for another exciting episode of the China History Podcast.